So let's switch to a little bit more about how to design those amazing computer chips that we just saw, how they're manufactured. But first, let's talk about the different kinds of semiconductors there are in the industry. And, and uh, th this is not too technical, but there's three major kinds of semiconductors that you should be aware of. The first one is called analog. Did you like that little animation? That's kind of clever. The first one is analog. In an analog chip, the levels of electricity go up and down in waves. This is the way the natural world works. So things, the electricity builds up and it fades away. So remember the switch, for example. When you turn on that light switch, the electricity doesn't immediately show up and the light turns on. It actually has to build up a little bit and then the light will happen. And then when you turn the switch off, it doesn't turn the light off instantaneously. The electricity kind of fades away. So in the real world, electricity goes up and down in waves. My voice goes up and down in waves. Everything goes up and down in waves. And that's what happens with the electricity in the computer chip. Describing that mathematically is extremely complicated. We use calculus and all kinds of really scary things like that in order to describe that behavior of electricity going up and down in waves. So years ago, engineers said, you know what, let's pretend that the electricity is either on or off. And they called this digital. That way, they could represent it mathematically so much easier. So if I could say when the light switch is on, the electricity is there immediately, and when I turn it off, no more electricity, then I only have to be able to count to one. So that when the electricity is on, I say one, and when it's off, I say zero. So this way, mathematically, I can talk about a bazillion switches on and off all over the place by just saying those that are on, that's one, and those that are off, that's zero. So instead of calculus and all these incredibly mathematical uh, terms, I'm down to one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. So it's interesting, if you ever see a movie where there's all these ones and zeros floating around in this computery environment, what that's representing is all the little switches, all the little transistors that are inside the computer and the ones that are on are represented by a one and the ones that are off are represented by a zero. So just a switch, on, off, on, off. Again, see how easy it is? You don't have to be an engineer. On, off, one, zero. And these are also, this, this mathematical uh, concept of on, off, one, zero is also known as logic or Boolean or truth tables. And, and you probably won't see that unless you want to go back to school and study a little bit of engineering or math. But anyway, it makes our lives really, really easy. So we simply think about the switch on and off. And we don't have to worry about the electricity building up and then fading away. Most of the chips that you would encounter in the stuff that you buy today, um, they're designed digitally, so digital stuff. You know, years ago, too, you could see on the back of, um, oh, like a Sony Walkman or something, it, they'd have this little emblem that said digital, as if that meant something really cool. Oh, it's digital. It must be better than something else. But that simply meant that when the engineers designed the chips, they were thinking one, zero, one, zero, on, off, on, off. The third type of semiconductor that I promised you I'd tell you about in the uh, first video of this series is called an FPGA, a Field Programmable Gate Array. These are specially made so that instead of waiting for the manufacturer to do all the layers and connect all the wires and place everything together in the chip, you can actually program it yourself on your desk. So that's why they call it Field Programmable. You can program this thing out in the field and you don't have to wait for a manufacturer to create the chip for you that you want. The um, engineer or you uh, takes the FPGA and it's got all the layers and all the stuff in there but nothing's really connected up properly. It's just there waiting for you to program it. You stick it in a special holder next to your computer, you connect it to your computer and you simply type. Please make this into a computer chip that, I don't know, runs a pacemaker or works in my microwave. And that's why you can program it over and over and over. The in, So they're very, very interesting in that um, you can configure them to do just about anything. The problem with them is they can become very expensive. So if you've invented a really cool chip for the latest tablet, um, in order to manufacture that, it would cost you a fortune. So you would switch back to a regular chip um, in manufacturing so that you could save costs. But these things are great for what they call prototyping. While you're experimenting around, it's really neat to be able to use an FPGA, a field programmable gate array. 
how on earth do you know what these things do? So you have a billion switches all going on all over the place all at one time. How on earth are you going to figure out what this thing is doing? Well, in the digital world, it's logical. It's easy. One, zero, one, zero, on, off, on, off. So let me show you how we do this. Um, we have a concept of a logic gate. And this is just an easy way that we represent what's happening in those complex chips. So a gate is simply a collection of transistors. And let me show you this in, uh, in, a, in a different way. Um, if I connect all these guys together in a special way, these are the transistors, by the way, I know they're pretty small to see. So they're all connected in a special configuration. When they're all turned on and off in the right way, the electricity can come in, the gate is like opened because all the switches are opened at the right time. The electricity goes through and then it comes out the other side. And then when the switches are turned off in the proper configuration, the gate closes and prevents the electricity from going through. So we use this concept of a gate just to make the math a little bit even easier for us to understand. And I'm going to, get a, going to give you an example here of a type of gate, and it's real easy, so, so you'll, you'll feel real smart after this. This is what we call an AND gate. So imagine inside here, there are a few little transistors, they're all connected properly, and when the electricity comes in and turns the switches on and off at the right time, that gate is going to open and let the electricity go through. So let me explain it in a little more detail. Let's say you want to design a cell phone ringer. So you want the phone to ring when a call comes in. I have what's called an AND gate that will say some electricity comes in here that says I have a call coming in and some switches are going to turn on. But I also want my line to be available. I don't want my cell phone ringing if my line's already tied up. So if electricity comes in here and says my line is available, then all the little transistor switches turn on at the right time and the electricity goes through and then makes it ring. So in the case where I don't have a call coming in, there's going to be no electricity here, but I do have a line available, so there'll be some electricity. But because I don't have electricity on this and on this, that gate's going to stay closed and no electricity is going to come through the other side. So that's why we call it an AND gate. In order for the gate to open up, you have to have electricity here and here on both of these wires coming in in order to open that gate, let the electricity go through, and then come out to the other side. There are lots and lots of different kinds of gates. An AND gate is the most simple one, but you can see from this it's very easy for us to understand now how to make a cell phone ringer, for instance, with a simple gate like an AND gate.